Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about Graves' disease. We're going to talk about what Graves' disease is, what are some of the signs and symptoms of Graves' disease, how do we diagnose it, and then what do we use to treat it. So Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder caused by stimulatory autoantibodies to the TSH receptor, so the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, that leads to hyperthyroidism. So again, Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder causes stimulatory autoantibodies to the TSH receptor that leads to hyperthyroidism. So just as a brief background as to how the thyroid functions normally, normally it all starts in the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus releases TRH or thyrotropin releasing hormone which acts on the anterior pituitary to stimulate the release of TSH. TSH then travels to the thyroid gland to stimulate the thyroid gland to release T4 and T3. And this T4 and T3 actually has a negative feedback regulation on the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, suppressing both TRH and TSH. So, with Graves' disease, if we're getting a production of stimulatory autoantibodies, antibodies that are targeting a person's own TSH receptors in the thyroid gland, so these are the antibodies, they target the TSH receptors on a thyroid cell in the thyroid gland, stimulates that thyroid cell to actually produce and release T4 and T3, that T4 and T3 would actually negatively regulate both the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland, leading to a suppressed level of TSH. So in Graves' disease, you can imagine we're getting high levels of T4 and T3 and low levels of TSH because of this negative feedback regulation. So we're going to talk more about this when we talk about how we actually diagnose Graves' disease, but I just wanted to show you the mechanism by which that can happen. Graves' disease is the most common cause of thyrotoxicosis. Thyrotoxicosis is this condition wherein we have very high levels of thyroid hormones leading to specific consequences. We're going to talk about more about thyrotoxicosis in a future lesson. Graves' disease can occur at any age, but generally peaks between the ages of 30 and 40 years. And females outnumber males 7 to 1. So Graves' disease is a predominantly female disease. And about 1.5 to 2% of women will get Graves' disease at some point in their lives. Graves' disease itself has a familial predisposition. There is an association with genes HLA-B8 and HLA-DR3, and there's also associations with other autoimmune disorders. So the signs and symptoms of Graves' disease depend on the effects of high levels of T4 and T3. This leads to hyperthyroidism. So Graves' disease, we see signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Some of those symptoms include anxiety and agitation, heat intolerance, sweating or excessive sweating, heart palpitations, weight loss, increased bowel movements, generally increased frequency of diarrhea, insomnia, so difficulty sleeping, tachycardia, so high rate of, or high, um, heart rate. This high heart rate can lead to onset of arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. There can be tremors, palmar erythema, so a reddening of the palms of the hands, hyperreflexia, and proximal weakness. So the signs and symptoms of Graves' disease are the signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, again, is due to the effects of high levels of T4 and T3. T4 and T3 regulate a wide variety of things in our body. And you can remember it by the M's, movement, mentation, and metabolism. 
movement, so increased movement, so hyperthyroidism, you can think of increased movement, agitation, uh, you can think of tremors, you can think of increased bowel movements, things are moving quickly. Mentation is that anxiety component. And the other one is uh, metabolism and the increased metabolism. You can think of the um, weight loss. You can think of having a high level of energy, insomnia, those types of things. So generally, Graves' disease, again, is hyperthyroidism. We're going to see signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Graves' disease also has some specific signs and symptoms with regards to its etiology. Some of the more specific signs and symptoms of Graves' disease include a thyroid goiter. Thyroid goiter is generally diffuse and it's described as rubbery. And there is no lymphadenopathy with the thyroid goiter. There's also what we call proptosis and exophthalmus, kind of a bulging of the eyes in these patients. And we're going to talk about more about why this happens in the next slide. There's also conjunctival injection, periorbital edema, so a swelling around the eyes, pretibial myxedema, acropachy, which is just a distal phalangeal clubbing. So all of these symptoms or all these signs are more specific to Graves' disease as opposed to just a general hyperthyroidism. Some of the other symptoms include diplopia, so a double vision due to some of these changes with regards to the eyes in people with Graves' disease, and also corneal abrasions just because with the proptosis and exophthalmus, the eyes generally are bulging out and they end up becoming dried out and can be easily... Um, easily abrased or easily um, have abrasions of the cornea. And that leads me into our next topic, which is Graves' ophthalmopathy. Graves' ophthalmopathy and Graves' disease aren't exactly the same thing. Some individuals can have Graves' ophthalmopathy without having the signs of hyperthyroidism but they may get those signs and symptoms later. Some individuals with Graves' disease will have the signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism without the Graves' ophthalmopathy. But they generally have the same cause. It's caused by an auto attack with those auto antibodies to retroorbital fibroblasts. So those auto antibodies in Graves' disease can stimulate the thyroid gland, but they can also cause damage to retroorbital fibroblasts, which lead to extraocular muscle involvement. So again, I want you to kind of separate these two entities out. Graves' ophthalmopathy and Graves' disease are not exactly the same thing, but they are part of the uh, same kind of entity. But again, some people can have Graves' ophthalmopathy without having the uh, signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Some people can have the hyperthyroidism without having this Graves' ophthalmopathy. And some people have both. And we can remember the signs and symptoms of Graves' ophthalmopathy with the mnemonic L specs. L stands for lid leg or lid retraction. S stands for soft tissue. This soft tissue is the periorbital edema, conjunctival injection, and chemosis. Some of those signs and symptoms I talked about in the previous slide. So those signs and symptoms are really related to the Graves' ophthalmopathy part of it. There's also the proptosis, the extraocular component, so the diplopia, so they start having the double vision, corneal abrasions for the C, and S for sight loss. And they are laid out in a way that... The earlier signs and symptoms of Graves' ophthalmopathy are the um, starting with L, and then the later signs and symptoms are later on in the mnemonic, so corneal abrasions and sight loss are later manifestations of Graves' ophthalmopathy. As the condition gets worse and worse, eyes begin, begin to um, pro uh, proptose or they have uh, oxephthalmus which lead to drying of the eyes, corneal abrasions, and sometimes eventually sight loss. 
So how do we make the diagnosis of Graves' disease? Diagnosis begins by looking at TSH and T4 levels. In Graves' disease, as we mentioned before, TSH levels are low because of that negative feedback inhibition by those high levels of T4. And again, we see increased free T4 levels. But this doesn't necessarily tell us that it is Graves' disease. We need something else. Some of the other components of Graves' disease that aren't as specific either are having a positive thyroglobin stimulating immunoglobulin, having antiproxidase being elevated. But what I really want you to remember is this radioiodine uptake test, this Ryu test. So when we see low, T T low TSH levels and increased free T4 levels, we can start thinking about hyperthyroidism. But to distinguish it between other causes of hyperthyroidism, like toxic adenomas, we can use a Ryu test. So the Ryu test shows increased iodine-131 uptake, or I-131 uptake. And it is a homogeneous uptake. So if we take a look at a Ryu scan. We can see here this is a normal thyroid with normal uptake of I-131 and in Graves' disease you can see this is quite increased and it is homogeneous because the antibodies have access and come into contact with the entire thyroid gland and this can lead to a homogeneous increased uptake of I-131. And this is distinguished between other causes or other thyroid diseases like toxic uh, multinodular goiter with multiple hot spots and toxic adenoma where there's one hot spot that's causing some hyperthyroidism. So Graves' disease, again, increased I-131 uptake that is homogeneous. We see low TSH levels and increased free T4 levels. And it's all due to... Uh, stimulatory autoantibodies to the TSH receptor. And one more quick note I want to discuss about diagnosing Graves' disease is biotin. And you may be thinking, why am I talking about biotin here? Biotin supplementation has become popular in recent years, and it's used for skin and nails and those types of things. But what has been found is that biotin supplementation can actually interfere with measurements of TSH and T4. And it has actually been found that individuals that actually take biotin supplements can actually have falsely low TSH measurements and or falsely high T4 levels. So it looks like they actually have hyperthyroidism. It actually looks like they might have Graves' disease. And some individuals can actually even be treated for Graves' disease, but they actually don't have it. It's really just because they're actually taking a biotin supplementation. So it's always important to ask patients if they're taking biotin supplements because it can or it may actually interfere with TSH and T4 measurements. Once we've made the diagnosis of Graves' disease, how do we treat it? Treatment is by thionamides. Thionamides include methimazole, which is the first-line treatment for Graves' disease, or propylthiouracil PTU. They both inhibit peroxidase catalyzed reactions to inhibit thyroid hormone synthesis. And PTU has a little extra component where it inhibits peripheral deion deionation of T4 to T3. And generally, patients continue treatment until remission of Graves' disease. Both of these medications have side effects, but PTU has specific side effects that we want to avoid and makes us weary of using PTU. Some of the side effects include hepatitis, agranulocytosis, fever, and rash. And the two first two, hepatitis and agranulocytosis, are what we really worry about. And this is why we generally want to start with methimazole and only use PTU in certain circumstances. I'll tell you when we use PTU. Other treatments for Graves' disease include beta blockers for symptomatic relief. can do thyroid ablation in certain circumstances using I-131. And in even severe cases, we may um, use subtotal or total thyroidectomies. So some special circumstances or special considerations with treatment. 
Pregnancy is the special consideration I want you to remember. And this is when we want to use PTU. We want to use PTU in the first trimester as methimazole has been shown to cause an embryopathy in pregnancy in the first trimester. We can then switch over to methimazole in the second and third trimester. So PTU in the first trimester, methimazole in the second and third trimester. For ophthalmopathy, there's a few different considerations we can employ. One is smoking sensation. Another one is preventing drying of the eyes. So we can think that with proptosis and exophthalmus, the eyes are um, you know, predisposed to excessive drying. Also, the smoking can also um, have some effects on bulging eyes. We may also end up using high-dose prednisone, and in severe cases, we may have to um, do orbital decompression. So anyways, guys, I hope you found this lesson helpful. This was a lesson on Graves' disease. If you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.